All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, to the workshop. Uh, so we have a, a, a couple of uh, really exciting uh, invited talks in our next session. Uh, so the first talk will be by Amy Zhang. So Amy is an assistant professor at uh, UT Austin in the uh, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Her group works on improving robustness and generalization for reinforcement learning agents. Uh, and today she will be talking about how we can leverage structure and abstractions uh, for improved uh, OOD generalization in reinforcement learning. So Amy, whenever you're ready, uh, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Ani, for the introduction. And, and uh, thank you for the organizers for organizing a workshop on such an important topic. Um, all right. So I'm just going to jump right in. Um, you know, I, I think for OOD generalization, we all understand that there's no free lunch, right? If we expect generalization, that means we're assuming some type of structure underlying in our problem. So today I want to talk about uh, two, I would say, fairly general forms, um, fairly relaxed types of, of assumptions of structure that we can make. Um, the first is, is this notion of compositionality, that our environment is made up of underlying common independent factors. And so we can expect generalization to new versions of the environment where fact there are um, maybe maybe different compositions of factors or uh, we see the same factors, but in, in kind of like uh, different scenarios. Um, and I think that's a bit more specific uh, than the kind of like next assumption that I'm going to make. So in the final two works that I'm going to talk about today, we're just going to focus on structure that exists in goal condition problems in general. And by goal conditioned, I just mean uh, tasks where our goal is a specific state that we would like to reach. All right, so with that, I'm just going to jump right in and talk about uh, structure and compositionality. So before I, I, I do that, I, I want to talk a little bit about what compositionality means, right? Like what, what is the set of under underlying assumptions that we're making when we talk about compositionality or compositional generalization? Um, so in, in RL, uh, you know, we typically deal with simulators, but I think a lot of this applies to robotics as well, um, you know, in block stacking or in proc gen, which is this, yeah. this uh, set of uh, uh, compositionally generated environments um, in simulators for autonomous driving. Um, and but then this also applies to real world scenarios, right? Like, uh, say, loading or unloading a dishwasher or um, navigating in a warehouse and manipulating boxes and, and objects in a warehouse scene. Uh, all of these have underlying components um, that we can become very familiar with and therefore generalize to new environments uh, with different configurations of those factors, right? So um, we, I think that factorization is a way like by, by discovering these factors or utilizing these factors in these environments is a way for us to achieve compositional generalization. And I, I think the notion of compositional generalization is something that uh, other subfields have actually explored a lot more than we have. Um, and so this figure is, is actually from this really nice paper called Compositionality Decomposed, How Do Neural Networks Generalize? Uh, and this is focusing on compositional generalization in language, actually, rather than robotics. And uh, they they have this really nice figure that defines these five types of generalization that we can expect. Um, so one is systematicity, generalization versus, uh, via systematically recombining known parts and rules, productivity, the ability to extend predictions beyond the length seen in training data, Substitutivity generalization via the ability to replace components with synonyms. Localism, um, if model decomposition or if model composition operations are local versus global, like if, if the rules are local versus global. And then overgeneralization, which is more of a trait, right? If, um, if models pay attention to or are robust to exceptions to rules. So I think a lot of these we can see can apply to robotics, but maybe not necessarily all of them. But I think there's already some related concepts um, that we use in RL to define MDPs that have this type of structure as well. And one example is the relational MDP, right? So a relational MDP family can be described by a set of classes that denote different types of objects, um, a set of function schemata that uh, takes those objects as inputs. And so these can be transformations uh, 
uh, to those objects or actions that you can take for some objects and maybe not others. Oh, sorry, actually the action um, specifically is the set of action schemata that operate on objects. And then for a specific domain, for a specific environment, we can talk about um, the uh, a set of domain objects um, and each of those objects come from a specific type or a specific class from C. And then we have our standard transition function and reward model, right? So you can see how this is a slight modification of the standard MDP definition that takes into account kind of common factors across domains. All right. So how can we leverage factorization in problems that have them, maybe specifically in robotics? And so in this paper from iClear that we presented this year, um, we presented this method called neural constraint satisfaction, which marries the strengths of non-parametric planning with object-centric representations. And so the main contribution of this work was to show that by factorizing the traditionally monolithic entity representation into a set of action invariant features, the you know, object type and action dependent features, its state, then uh, we can reuse these components during planning and control. All right, so to implement this factorization, NCS first constructs a two level hierarchy, which abstracts the experience buffer into a graph over state transitions of individual entities. Right, separated from other contextual entities. So to solve new arrangement, um, and so this is specifically focused on object rearrangement. And so to solve new rearrangement problems, NCS infers what state transitions can be taken given the current and goal image observations and recomposes sequences of state transitions from the graph and translate these transitions into actions. Um, so the first problem that comes up is the correspondence problem of how we can abstract these raw sensory motor signal, um, which in our case is this high dimensional observation space pixels into representations of entities um, such that there's a correspondence between how an agent intervenes on an entity and how its action affects an object in the environment, right? And so the very first step is uh, actually extracting out what an entity is. And we can actually do this using self-supervised um, object detection methods. Uh, and the idea being that these methods already do kind of like the, the kind of like, um, like already exhibit a desired property, which is that it determines what pixels are correlated across a data set of images and uh, encompasses that into a specific factor, right? Into a specific entity. And so then uh, once we've discovered these entities and mapped them across different images or across different frames or across different states in a trajectory, um, then we can start using them as abstractions. So the second part of this problem is the combinatorial one, which is how do we actually represent this combinatorial task space in a way that allows us to get this type of generalization across different domains where we have uh, different objects or different numbers of objects or combinations of objects uh, in these different domains, right? And the point that we leverage in this paper is that the same state transition can manifest for different objects and in different contexts, right? So if we're only focusing on a specific target object in this image, this pink um, object, this pink cube, it doesn't matter what's going on with any of the other objects in this scene, right? Which means that we can now generalize to uh, like use this transition or um, uh, leverage this transition in a different version of this environment where there are other additional objects or objects that have been removed. Okay, so NCS constructs a two-level abstraction hierarchy to model transitions in the experience buffer, right? So in the first, NCS learns to infer a set of entities from sensory motor transitions with pick and move options. So um, actions. So we're assuming a very high level action space where an entity is moved per transition. So we don't necessarily need to do this. Uh, we can learn these abstractions using lower level action spaces, but it just means that it would require multiple steps of moves. Um, and so it was much simpler to first kind of think of each of these transitions as only taking a single action rather than having to uh, account for multiple actions or learn abstractions of skills, right? Anyway, 
And then our dynamics model can learn to sparsely predict the states um, shown with the different textures in this figure of the entities at the next time step. Right. And so this addresses the correspondence problem by forcing the network to predict and reconstruct observations through an entity bottleneck. And so this way we can kind of keep track of the same objects throughout a trajectory. So once we have these entities and these one step transitions of how these entities are moving within a trajectory, uh, we can now build a graph. And um, how this graph is different from prior works is that instead of building a graph where nodes corresponds to the entire state, right, where now the state is unique to a domain, where a domain kind of like represents the number and combination or the specific set of objects, um, we're now constructing a per entity graph, where a graph just shows how a single abstract object type moves around um, um, where we can now kind of group together all of the uh, all of the versions of the that entity across all of the different trajectories, across all of the different domains that we have in our data set. And so we can do this by clustering these entity transitions that share similar initial states and final states. So this is one way in which we can kind of aggregate all of the information that we have about abstract entities in our data set across different domains. And so now uh, we can actually figure out how to use this for planning and control, right? Um, so given a rearrangement problem specified only by a current observation and a goal observation, we can now decompose this rearrangement problem into a sub-problem per entity. All right, so, um, for, for, so the first step is to run this self-supervised object detection method on our new domain and then randomly select an entity from our domain and uh, search in our graph how to move it from its current location to the goal location, right? And now we can do this independently per entity. Uh, we can look up the action, which is just an edge in our graph. And if there is a failure, um, basically, you know, if we have like a block stacking scenario where uh, we can't move, say, like a lower, uh, uh, a lower block in a stack, then we can try and fail on that entity and then pick another entity and try again, right? So basically with enough of these random selections of entities, we know that we'll pick, we'll find the right ordering of movements for entities so that we can actually solve uh, block stacking examples as well. Right. So um, in the figure on the top left, we can see this is a partitioning of states from the training set into equivalence classes. So the nodes represent um, these equivalence classes over states, right? So this is specifically a clustering of states inferred from uh, uh, um, the RoboGym simulation environment, uh, where we've created this rearrangement uh, task. So we have a library of objects that we randomly select from to create a to create each domain. And then these clusters just represent the abstract entities that we've extracted out. Uh, and then these slot attention masks are just averaged over all of the entities in this cluster. So you can see that, that what we're actually, uh, the information that we're taking away from those observations just corresponds to the object location. Because for pick and place action space, uh, the action is determined only by the location of the object. So just from the um, actions, the transitions that we have in our data set and um, this slot attention-based method, we've extracted that the only information that we care about in this environment and in, with this action space is location of the object. All right, and so this table or these tables just compare our method and CS with various baselines on both complete and partial evaluation settings. So partial evaluation just corresponds to the setting where we don't necessarily have an entire goal image of uh, the kind of like final required placement of all objects. And we only have say a partial specification that certain objects have to be in certain goal locations. So these objects were trained, um, sorry, these methods were trained on four objects and evaluated on their ability to generalize to four, five, six, and seven objects. And we report the fractional success rate uh, as well as standard error computed over 10 seeds. Uh, 
And so we see that across a lot of these methods, um, you know, reinforcement learning based methods, behavior cloning based methods, MPC, um, they're not really able to perform very well in these settings and don't really generalize across different numbers of objects, whereas we're able to achieve much better performance. And there's obviously still a lot of room for improvement. Um, we actually find that a lot of this performance gap is actually caused by errors in each of the steps in this process, right? So if we have some error in our slot attention for extracting out entities, or if there is an error in, in terms of pick and place, so it's it's um, not magic, we're actually using uh, uh, a controller to to actually perform pick and place. And so there is some stochasticity in our transitions. Um, so all of these things contribute to lower performance um, in these in terms of these success rates. All right. Um, so I want to move on now to talk about just general goal condition problems, right? And so um, in this work, we specifically focus on the fact that there is geometric structure that exists in goal conditioned um, RL problems, right? And so, you know, this is just a graphic kind of showing like what I mean by goal conditioned problems. Um, and so we're just trying to find an optimal goal reaching value function for some target MDP. So it turns out that this uh, optimal goal reaching value function is a quasi metric. And we actually have a theoretical result in our paper that shows that the set of all possible optimal value functions is exactly the set of quasi metrics. So every quasi metric corresponds to um, an optimal value function for some MDP with some dynamics uh, and vice versa, right? Every optimal value function for any MDP is also a quasi metric. And the thing to point out uh, is that the reason we're focusing on goal condition problems here is that this type of structure doesn't exist in single task RL, right? So this is specific to goal reaching, where our goal space is the same as our state space. All right. So given that, so we're again kind of assuming that we have this offline data set um, or replay buffer of transitions where we can sample these transitions from a replay buffer. Um, we can sample random states and random goals to specify some task. And uh, we introduce quasi-metric RL, which optimizes a quasi-metric embedding as a negated value function, right? So now we're just saying we are imposing a, a uh, constraint on our value function. We're imposing a constraint on the architecture of our value function so that it has to be a quasi-metric. Right. And the, to just to remind the audience, the difference between a quasi-metric and a metric is just that a quasi-metric does not insist that the distance function between distinct elements, S and G, is commutative. Right. So if we were to use a standard metric for learning a value function, which we've done in our own prior work, it basically is incorporating an additional assumption that your dynamics and your MDP are reversible, which in a lot of safe settings is true. You know, so if we're thinking about um, just moving objects around on a tabletop where you kind of have a border around your uh, your your play area, then this is the setting where dynamics are pretty much reversible. But if you have an object fall off the edge of your table, then that's not something that we can easily recover from, right? By taking the reverse of an action. Um, so in that case, our our dynamics are clearly not reversible, and this is a setting in which um, enforcing our value function to be a quasi-metric makes a lot of sense. All right. So um, we first have some toy experiments uh, in this mountain car setting. And so this is basically the simplest setting that we can imagine where our dynamics are clearly not reversible, right? So, you know, this, this mountain car can try to climb up this hill, but as soon as it stops, it's going to roll back down, right? So the dynamics are not the same in both directions. Um, so here we can just see uh, the ground truth dynamics of our system, right? Um, and then we see what we, the optimal value function, um, Sorry, this is a visualization of the optimal value function for different goal points in this hill, in this hill environment, as well as uh, what we learn with QRL, as well as a comparison to what standard Q learning is learning. So this imposes no constraints on our Q function. It's just a neural network. So it's a universal function approximator. 
um, as well as some other methods. So conservative Q-learning and contrastive RL, right? And then this is an example of our QRL objective where instead of uh, imposing that our value function is a quasi-metric, we instead just impose that it's a metric, right? It's, it's just L2 distance in some latent representation space. Um, cool, all right. So um, on the left-hand side for all of these figures, we have uh, just the ground truth distances as well as the expected distance for the behavior policy that generated the data set. And then these are kind of all of the learned versions, right? So we can see by just doing a visual comparison between ground truth and our learned Q functions, that QRL is the one that is really capturing uh, the, the same structure that exists in the ground truth Q function. All right. So QRL learns an optimal decision-aware representation, right? So we can kind of like think of this uh, quasi-metric space um, that we're learning. So we're learning this D-latent um, that should just correspond to the optimal state reaching cost. Right? All right. Um, and so then now we can actually use this quasi-metric for downstream control. All right. So um, we have some additional experiments um, benchmarking QRL, again, just in the offline RL setting. So the first is this maze 2D environment where we just need to guide a ball through a maze towards a target location. We have different versions of this maze. Um, and QRL can learn this policy network by just backpropping through the latent world model. All right. So we have results on this for the single goal as well as multi-goal setting across different configurations of mazes, um, large, medium, and U maze. And we compare again against contrastive RL, um, MSG, uh, which is a gradient-based approach. I actually don't remember what MSG stands for, but MSG combined with hindsight experience replay as well as planning-based methods, um, MPPI, and then decision diffuser, so this is more of a trajectory modeling uh, approach, and then diffuser with a hand-coded controller, right? So um, one problem with diffuser is that it does a good job of generating kind of like a trajectory of states that you should follow, but doesn't do as well with predicting those actions correctly. And so we actually achieve much better performance by incorporating a hand-coded controller, so having a separate method for learning the actions for extracting actions um, given a goal state. And so uh, we see much better performance in this column compared to just straight diffuser. So these scores represent average normalized episodic return where 100 represents um, comparable performance with a D4RL reference uh, hand-coded controller. Yeah. And so again, we can kind of see that QRL is able to outperform all of these other methods and is able to achieve better sample efficiency and generalization performance because it's leveraging this geometric structure that exists in the goal conditioned um, RL problem. Right. Um, so we also evaluate QRL in an online setting. So um, in a, for the online setting, we again kind of use this um, uh, robo gym environment. And so here the robot is just trying to push, say push a block, right? And so now we're also focusing on continuous action spaces. All right. Um, and so here for the online learning setting, um, we're comparing again against contrastive RL, goal condition behavior cloning, um, DDPG plus her, um, a DDPG plus her plus the quasi metric, um, and uh, or I guess two different types of quasi metric methods. And so again, we can kind of see that QRL learns faster and better compared to baseline methods across all environments for both state-based and image-based observations. All right, so that's kind of just showing that there is this geometric structure that exists in goal-conditioned RL problems. And by leveraging that, by incorporating that structure into um, the architecture of our value function, we can achieve better performance across a gamut of goal-conditioned RL problems or goal-conditioned robotics problems. So there's, a, there's kind of one additional thing that we can also do in the goal condition setting that is instead related to just richer learning signal. So one problem with the goal conditioned RL problem, kind of like why it's so hard, is that the standard reward function that we use is very sparse, right? 
So usually we assume that we're not getting any reward from the environment until we actually reach the goal state, in which case we, we receive a reward of one, right? And so learning goal condition policies under the sparse reward is very difficult. So I just wanna first introduce um, F divergence as a way of matching distributions. So F divergence is um, a notion of distance between uh, probability distributions. And so um, here's just kind of a graphic showing what, uh, how, how divergence, what divergence between two probability distributions looks like as those distributions change over time. Um, and so you can kind of think of these as just, they're just different, uh, they're just different notions of distance, right? Like they both get larger if the distributions move further away. Um, they all get smaller if the distributions become closer, but the rate at which they do, like what value they take can be different, right? And so there are many different F divergences that we can use. And um, we, we do find kind of like different performance when using different F divergences. But I think the main thing to take away from this slide is that depending on the dynamics of your system, depending on how um, the probability distributions over states changes in your environment, different divergences can get better or worse performance. So it really kind of just depends on your dynamics. Um, but so just to dive right in, uh, we propose this method called F policy, uh, F policy gradients. And our policy is learned by minimizing um, a slightly different objective than what the standard goal condition RL objective is, right? So um, our objective here is to minimize the F divergence between our current uh, state occupancy exhibited by our current policy and our goal. Right, so P theta is the agent state visitation distribution and PG is the distribution of the goal. So we could actually do this for any, any kind of reinforcement learning, any kind of robotics, any kind of control problem. Um, but in most settings, assuming that we have access to this distribution over the goal space is a pretty restrictive assumption, except in the goal condition setting or even, or imitation learning settings, right? When we have access to demonstrations, because in both of these settings, we actually do have access to the distribution over the goal. In the goal condition setting, it's easy because it's just a Dirac function, right? Like it's just a delta right at the goal state. Uh, and then in imitation learning or learning from demonstration settings, um, if we're given a set of demonstrations, then we're kind of we're we're given a, a sampling from PG, which we could use to compute the distribution over the goal space. All right. Um, all right. So okay, I kind of covered this already. So we want to the agent to be um, by minimizing this F divergence, we just want our agent to be at the goal state with high probability. And so this is, uh, we show in our paper that this is equivalent to the standard goal conditioned RL objective. Um, we show that this objective does produce the optimal policy. Uh, and it turns out that we can optimize for this objective by taking the gradient. So we actually derive the analytical gradient for the F divergence. And it turns out that this looks very similar to a policy gradient where the gradient of log probabilities of the policy are weighted by this term um, F prime, right? Uh, and, and I think one thing I wanna point out is that this dense weight is not a reward because it's non-stationary, it depends on the current policy. So we can't call this a reward function. Instead, it's uh, because it's non-stationary, we can maybe call it an intrinsic reward, but we're, we're just calling this learning signal, right? So it's a richer learning signal. It's a dense learning signal that we have access to in any goal conditioned RL problem. And I just wanna point out one additional thing, which is um, we could actually call this max -ent RL. This is different from the standard definition of max RL, which is just saying, I want to learn an optimal policy that has the highest entropy, where the entropy is being computed on the policy's action distribution just in a single step, right? Um, I think this is actually a better form of max uh, And so we, we actually call this state max where we're actually learning a policy that is maximizing entropy over the state distribution, right? So it, it um, basically until it has, uh, until we start extracting learning signal um, by knowing where the goal is, 
this uh, learning objective is just going to learn a very exploratory policy that just tries to put uh, discovery, discover every state in our uh, state space. All right. And so maximizing, um, basically we find that maximizing the entropy, uh, sorry, maximizing this objective ensures exploration in a way that uh, the standard maxent definition of maximizing the entropy of the policy does not. All right. Um, so it also turns out that uh, this objective looks a lot like existing metric-based shaping rewards. So depending on the F divergence that you do, this can look a lot like a, uh, um, a richer learning signal just using, say, like L2 distance between your current state and your goal or a temporal like reachability distance. Um, all right. And so we have... Uh, examples of what this looks like in grid world settings, which is really nice because you can actually see how the state occupancy of the policy changes over time. Um, we also scale up to more complex domains, um, including these maze configurations as well as fetch reach. And I think the thing I just want to point out from these uh, results are that we are able to achieve, um, we have much stabler performance, right? We, we achieve higher success rates, but we also have lower variance compared to existing methods. Uh, and with that, I wanna conclude, I know I'm running over on time already, uh, but I kind of just wanna end with some open questions. Uh, do existing benchmarks test all the forms of generalization that we care about? And I, I think the answer here is no. And so maybe we can discuss this a little bit more later. Um, are these assumptions the right level of granularity, right? Or are there others that are useful for other types of problems? You know, this is only a couple of possible assumptions that we can make. Um, and I'm sure that there are others that are very interesting for a lot of robotics problems that we care about. And I would love to see, you know, how we can leverage these new and different assumptions for better generalization. And with that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. I think we have time for maybe a question or two. We're just going to switch the audio and then um, open it up, up for questions. Yeah, the last thing. Hi. Can you hear us, Amy? Yes. Perfect. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I, I guess my question was for the last part. How do you decide? which divergence to use. Sorry, I didn't actually uh, catch the question. Was for the last part, how to decide what F divergence metric to use? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have a lot of intuition actually for uh, what properties of different dynamics of different MDPs correspond better to different F divergences. Um, in our experiments, we did find that different F divergences led to different performance. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a mo more coherent answer than that. One more question from the audience. So actually, maybe I can ask a question. So on the, the first part of the, the talk, um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's some kind of story about causal inference, like do you interpret what you're doing as learning causal models that you can kind of do interventions on and, and that leads to compositional generalization or is that not uh, kind of how you think about it? Yeah, um, so I think that, so um, yes, I, I think that what we're in effect kind of building is a causal graph. Um, you know, I, I think to push the causal inference envelope further, we should also be talking about counterfactuals, performing interventions in the environment. And we were doing this in an offline setting. So in some sense, like we don't have any interventional data, so we're not really doing causal inference. But I, I think that, uh, you know, there are extensions of that work where we can make that, that uh, connection more closely. But yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, so we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you. Thank you.